So with all this information about genetics, what can we do with it? How can we use our knowledge of genetics as tools to help make our life better, perhaps? We're going to take a look at some specific applications of genetics. Establishing identity. We can use genetics in forensic applications. If you've watched CSI, you know that this is possible. Historical identity, identifying remains, for example. DNA fingerprinting, identifying or figuring out someone's identity just based on their DNA and then storing that in a database. We can use genetic information in healthcare. This is becoming more and more widely practiced in the healthcare industry. We can use it in agriculture, low tech and high tech. It's been used in agriculture for, for years, but now we have a, a high tech version of this. If we're going to establish identity, there's different ways of, of talking about identity establishing. Forensics is one of the big ones. Crime scene analysis. If you have crime scene evidence and you want to match it to a sub suspect, using DNA now becomes much, much more accurate in determining whether or not somebody is actually guilty of a particular crime. It used to be before DNA was used, back before the 1980s, uh, the evidence at a crime scene oftentimes wasn't really ironclad evidence, but you build up enough of it and you can kind of come up with an idea of this particular suspect did it. There are some problems there. Sometimes a lot of evidence is built up and it makes it look like a certain person is guilty, but the DNA contradicts that. Uh, since 1989, when the first person was let off out of prison because their DNA evidence proved that they weren't there, 317 suspects or prisoners have been exonerated since 1989. 18 of them were scheduled to be executed. That's a pretty big number of people that would have spent their lives in prison or gone to the electric chair in Texas, for example, or to uh, be executed that weren't actually guilty. DNA is able to, was able to save those people, to exonerate them. Some examples were, would be Ron Jones in Chicago, uh, Ford Heights 4, uh, Cornelius Dupree Jr. These are all names, classic names of, of cases that were exonerated because of DNA evidence. And you'll have a chance to explore some of these uh, in a little bit. About uh, 15 years ago, the O.J. Simpson trial, which O.J. Simpson was a football player turned actor, celebrity, who was accused of killing his wife, ex-wife, and her friend. Uh, it was, what's important about that trial was that it was the first time that DNA evidence had a public forum. This was where most people, average people on the street became aware of DNA and what it could do. And there was quite a bit of um, trial and error with how to bring this into the justice system. Uh, the head of the crime lab in LA, Dr. Henry Wu, was put on the stand and the defense tried to pick apart his technique to make that evidence disallowable. And it, it was figured out during this trial how powerful a tool DNA evidence can be. Uh, when President Clinton was deposed on the whole uh, scandal that happened in the, in the White House with uh, his intern, Monica Lewinsky, DNA evidence became, played, a, played a role there as well. And then back in 2001, when the World Trade Center disaster occurred, DNA was used to help identify the remains in many cases where there wasn't much to go on. And they were able to figure out who was there in the building, who had been killed and who hadn't. From a historical perspective, 
we could use DNA to identify long dead remains. Or we can use it to prove who the father is, paternity. Used to be paternity tests were blood typing. Now they're DNA. Almost 100% accuracy. Some interesting cases, which you'll do a little bit of reading on in a little bit. Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemming. Tsar Nicholas II, if you're familiar with the story of Anastasia, that was her family. Uh, and then a very particularly interesting one, the Kohanim Jews and the Lemba tribe of Africa and their relationships to one another. Sometimes DNA can help to re revive an extinct species or nearly extinct species. There were uh, two types of grapes that had gone nearly gone extinct. And in a lab, they were able to recreate using the DNA from an old sample. They were able to recreate these two strains of, of grapes. And one of them has become very, very popular, the Pinot Noir grape, which is used to make wine. This brings up, of course, though, the question of ethics. A lot of this is really useful, identifying remains of loved ones exonerating people who were formerly thought of being criminals and, and saying that, okay, you're free to go, you can live your life now because it wasn't you. But then you get into some very gray areas about bringing back extinct species, for example. Seems pretty innocuous when you're talking about grapes. How bad could it be to bring back grapes? But where do you stop? Because if we can bring back one extinct species, why not all of them? And pretty soon we have T-Rexes running around. Where do you stop? Where do you draw the line? Just because you can do something, does that really mean that you should? Some things to think about. Some of the cases that were mentioned in this video you will be researching and presenting to your classmates so that we can all learn a little bit more about some of these applications of genetics. In healthcare, we're really interested in looking at the difference between genetic diseases and acquired diseases. Uh, an acquired disease is something you catch from somebody else. You know, a genetic disease is something you're, you inherit, you're born with. The difference between these two types of diseases is really four, based on four different things. Uh, you can't tell when you're going to get your next cold or how, what your risk is of getting your next cold. You can absolutely tell the risk of getting a certain genetic disease based on either family studies or your overall risk and absolute risk. You often can't tell if somebody has a cold before they have symptoms or the flu. But you can test before any symptoms arise for genetic diseases and figure out whether or not somebody has. Many diseases have pre-symptomatic testing. They do a sequence of a particular gene, and they can tell you based on the spelling of that gene, the sequence of bases, whether or not you've got that disease. Different populations have different frequencies of genetic diseases. We already talked about Tay-Sachs disease and the Ashkenazi Jews. But everybody's more or less of the same risk to acquire diseases. You get the flu, every population has the same chance of getting the flu. Certain individuals might be more resistant, but in general, your population has nothing to do with whether or not you're going to get it. And finally, and this is an interesting one, gene therapy, which has been around for 30 years or so, but is now starting to become refined as a way of curing genetic diseases, making them go away forever. Whereas most acquired diseases because of the nature of the disease, it's hard to make them go away forever. Some we can vaccinate against, but those diseases are still out there. Other people can get them. If you can correct someone's genetic disease, they won't be able to pass that on anymore, the disease, to their offspring. You effectively kill off that disease at that person. It won't go any further. In agriculture, the big buzzwords now are genetically modified foods. Later on, you're going to watch a, uh, a rather interesting video 
talking about genetically modified foods. Are they really bad for us? We use the term transgenic when we take an organism that has genes from another organism. For example, Bt corn. All corn in this country is genetically modified. It has genes from other plants to help it resist parasites. Vitamin A rice or golden rice was created as a way of giving vitamin A to individuals in third world countries that didn't have access to vitamin A. Again, where's the line? Where do we stop? We can now easily insert genes from one organism into another. But where do we draw the line? These are things to think about as we look further at the applications of genetics.